1962, a failing encyclopedia salesman chased an opportunity to sell Japanese running shoes instead. They were on track to dominate the market until he discovered a design that turned a $50 loan into a $34 billion company. After graduating from Stanford Business School, 24-year-old Phil Knight moved back to his parents' home in Oregon. Late at night, he would lie on his back in his childhood bed and stare at all of his textbooks, trophies, and blue ribbons. This is me, still? He'd say to himself. Like all of his friends, Phil wanted to be successful, but he still didn't know what that meant for him. Money? Maybe. A family and a house? Sure, if I was lucky. These were the goals he was taught to aspire to, but deep down he wanted something more meaningful. Something purposeful, creative, important, and above all, different. As always, these trails of thoughts brought him back to his idea, one that he saw as being potentially huge while others saw as crazy. At Stanford, he wrote a research paper on how Japanese cameras dominated the camera market and that they could do the same thing for running shoes. He even developed a blueprint on how superior running shoes could be produced inexpensively in Japan. Being a runner himself, he knew a thing or two about the difference it would make, all thanks to his former coach, Bill Bowerman. When Phil ran for him at the University of Oregon, he noticed Bill would constantly sneak into the locker room and steal the runner's footwear. He would tear them apart, stitch them back up, and only hand them back after making some kind of modification. They either made the runners run like deer or bleed. He had good intentions though. He wanted his runners to have sleeker, softer, and lighter shoes to improve their performance. To pursue his idea, Phil knew he had to leave his comfort zone. He was already planning to backpack around the world and decided to make a detour in Japan. His goal was to meet with Onitsuka's executives and ask if he could import their tiger shoes. They were extremely popular, and the design prevented long-distance runners from getting blisters. Interestingly, the founder came up with the design when he was eating sushi and realized an octopus legs had a firm grip because of the suction cups at the bottom. Before Phil could seriously think about approaching them, he needed his father's approval and a loan. He just had to bring himself to pitch Onitsuka next. But first, he needed to make his first stop, Hawaii. After one dive at Waikiki Beach, Phil and his Stanford classmate, Gary Carter, decided to stay longer than planned and take up surfing. So, they both got jobs selling encyclopedias door to door. Phil stuck with it for weeks before quitting. He couldn't get past his shyness and failed to make a single sale. I think maybe the time has come to leave Shangri-La, he finally admitted to Greg. The next day, Phil bought a ticket to Japan. He wasted no time in pursuing his idea and arranged a meeting with Onitsuka. After saying merely one word, his pitch was interrupted by one executive. What company are you with? He asked. Phil froze. He wasn't expecting that question and felt the need to run and hide to the safest place he knew, his parents' home. He pictured his blue ribbons from the track pinned to his bedroom wall, the only thing he was proud of. Blue Ribbon Blue Ribbon, he blurted as the idea struck him. All of the executives smiled, encouraging Phil to continue his pitch. Phil explained that America's shoe market was enormous and untapped, and that if Onitsuka stepped in, they could beat Adidas and become a profitable venture. The executives leaned back and stared at each other. Would Blue Ribbon be interested in representing Tiger Shoes in the US? They asked. Yes, they would, Phil responded without hesitation. And just like that, he made his first order after borrowing $50 from his father. 
Only much later would he realize that business is never that simple. Over the next few years, Phil found himself repeatedly flying back to Japan to put out fires. Someone else claimed to be Onitsuka's U.S. distributor and threatened him, not once, but twice. Several banks refused to lend him money, even though his sales were increasing. Onitsuka becomes frustrated and starts to secretly look for other distributors. Still, Phil remains loyal and starts working as an accountant six days a week before teaching at Portland State University to keep the company afloat. Dear Gary, did you ever leave Shangri-La? I'm an accountant now and giving some thought to blowing my brains out, he once wrote in a letter. Meanwhile, Phil's business partner, Coach Bill, starts thinking about how Onitsuka can modify their shoes for Americans. Their bodies are longer and heavier than the Japanese and would need a sole with more support. After sending the founder and production team a slew of notes, sketches, and designs, they finally gave in and made a prototype. Eventually, several American athletes start training in Tigers, and Blue Ribbon makes over $1 million in sales. Still, Onitsuka is disappointed. You should be doing much better, one executive argued. Stunned, Phil explained that Blue Ribbon sales had been doubling each year. They could only increase their number if they ordered more shoes, but banks won't lend them more money. So, he suggested the idea of borrowing money from a trading company. The executive Lee immediately shot down the idea. His solution? Sell Blue Ribbon to Onitsuka. What about our written agreement? Phil asked. The executive merely shrugged. Selling wasn't an option for Phil. He didn't have a backup plan and needed time to think. So, he told the executive that he would have to talk it over with Bill. Instead, he begged his bank to lend him more money. They not only said no, but closed his account too. There was no such thing as venture capital back then, so Phil had no choice but to borrow from a Japanese trading company called Nisho EY. With their support, he pivoted his original idea into a backup plan, manufacturing his own shoes. But first, he needed to come up with a name. He settled on Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. One of his salesmen dreamt about the idea the night before their deadline. Next, he needed a logo. He contacted a young artist that he met while teaching. A logo that shows motion, he told her. With little direction, she came up with something simple and timeless. Eventually, Phil started working with a Japanese manufacturer called Nippon Rubber. He first asked them to make a shoe based on one of Bill's designs, which inspired Onitsuka's Cortez line. The results were impressive. Still, Bill was convinced they needed something better. His runners were now running on polyurethane, a spongy surface used for the Olympics, and their shoes no longer gave them the right grip. But what could he possibly do? The outer sole of a running shoe, which was either waves or grooves across the bottom of the foot, hadn't changed in 50 years. To no one's surprise, it only took him a week to come up with an idea. Like Onitsuka's founder, his inspiration came from everyday things, things you might eat or find laying around the house. While having breakfast with his wife, he noticed his waffle iron had a gridded pattern. After many failed attempts, he successfully created a waffle-like sole. When he handed them to one of his runners, his grip improved, and even better, he ran like a rabbit. After telling Phil, they hurriedly called Nippon, forget the Cortez, we've got something new. When Onitsuka found out, they demanded that Blue Ribbon pay them nearly $17,000. Instead, they took them to court. It was a risk that could have made Blue Ribbon bankrupt and ultimately fail. Fortunately, a federal judge ruled in Blue Ribbon's favor and Onitsuka had to pay a settlement. 
A year later, Blue Ribbon took off. They had retail stores in Berkeley, Los Angeles, Portland, and New England. But every penny was put back into the business, leaving them with little profit and a heavy burden. They still owed Nisho's $1 million. Being around $75,000 short, they decided to empty all of their store's bank accounts and divert the money to their home office accountant temporarily. Two days later, they had another burden to deal with. The Bank of California froze its accounts and called the FBI. It looks like fraud, they nonchalantly told them. Phil had no choice but to tell Nisho and ask for another $1 million loan. They agreed to consider only after reviewing their financials. It was then that Phil realized their numbers were worse than he thought. Tom Sumaragi, the first Nisho employee that took a chance on him, admitted that he'd always waited to invoice him. Tom knew the company was struggling and would wait until he suspected they had enough money. Why did you do such a thing? Tom's superior Tadayuki Ito demanded. Because I think they'll be successful, he admitted. Nike is my business child. Hours later, Tadayuki forgave Phil and Tom. He gave Phil another $1 million and went to the Bank of California to pay off his debt. Before leaving, he turned to the banker who repeatedly created problems for Phil. One more thing, he said. I believe your bank has been negotiating to become one of Nisho's banks? That's right, the banker told him. Ah, I must tell you that it will be a waste of your time to pursue those negotiations any further. Eventually, Phil changed the company's name from Blue Ribbon to Nike. It became more than just a brand and into a household word. He envisioned that one day, people would start wearing Nikes everywhere, to class, at the grocery store, and throughout their everyday lives. But Nike would need to continue innovating and taking more chances. In 1977, that fateful day came. Frank Rudy, a former aerospace engineer, pitched an idea that many rejected and saw as crazy, even Adidas. Mr. Knight, I've come up with a way to inject air into a running shoe, he explained to Phil. Why? Phil asked. For greater support, he answered. For the ride of a lifetime. Phil finally understood how some people felt when he told them about his own crazy idea years ago. Even though it sounded like comic book stuff, he insisted on trying Frank's prototype and went for a six mile run. He was hooked. Although a bit unstable, they were still one heck of a ride just like Frank pitched. I think we have something here, he told his team before signing a deal with Frank that evening. Phil was convinced it was only a matter of time until his vision for Nike became a reality. And then the letter came. In a standard white envelope with an embossed return address was a bill from the US Customs Service for $25 million. They claimed that Nike owed them import fees because their shoes were manufactured outside the country. After investigating, Phil discovered that his competitors were to blame. To slow down Nike's growth, Converse, Keds, and a few small factories lobbied the White House and convinced custom officials to enforce an outdated law. Phil fought back and filed a $25 million antitrust lawsuit alleging that they conspired to take out Nike through underhanded business practices. Immediately, the government asked to settle. Phil agreed to only pay $9 million instead. The lawsuit turned out to be Nike's final battle before they were able to go public that year. Over the next few years, they managed to sign some of the world's greatest athletes including Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, and Serena Williams. They also replaced Adidas as the official maker of the NBA uniforms and apparel. In his memoir, Phil shares what advice he'd give to others who struggle to find their own definition of success, as he did before starting Nike. I would tell men and women in their mid-twenties to not settle for a job, or a profession, or even a career. Seek a calling. If you're following your calling, the fatigue will be easier to bear, the disappointments will be fuel, the highs will be like nothing you've ever felt. This is the story of how Nike went from being a struggling startup to a Fortune 500 company and eventually the world's largest athletic footwear and apparel brand.
For more inspiring stories and advice from today's successful leaders, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.